Hello, may I welcome to the stage Dan Held, general partner at Asymmetric. How are you doing? Thanks for having me. I uh, just got in. Dan raced it here from uh, the other side of West London. Uh, I hope the traffic wasn't too bad. Now, um, before we get into it, I have to ask you, HBO recently did a big documentary. They claimed that Peter Todd could be Satoshi Nakamoto. What are your views? I did have a brief cameo in that. Uh, but yeah, the uh, HBO documentary was trying to uncover who was Satoshi. Now, I've spent 12 years in this space and everyone has their, f their favorite Satoshi theory of who he might be. By the way, he self-identified as a he, so it's likely to be a male. And I think he's pr it's probably one person rather than a group of people because to keep a secret like that amongst a group would be very, very difficult. And so Peter Todd was the proposed uh, Satoshi candidate. Peter Todd, I believe, would have been 11 years old. I, think, would have, I think like 14, I think. 14. So yes, he could have been Satoshi, but he would have been a very, very young Satoshi. And there's many other things. If you look at how Satoshi had written the code of Bitcoin, Peter Todd, his code in his style was nothing like that. So I find Peter Todd as a, can a Satoshi candidate a very, very low probability. Who's your highest probability candidate? Well, amongst the OGs in the space, Nick Zabo. Uh, Nick Zabo or Hal Finney. Hal Finney's a, a classic favorite. He died around the time Satoshi disappeared. Uh, Hal ghost wrote PGP encryption, which PGP uh, was considered a weapons export in the 1990s. And so cryptographers back then printed out computer code of the PGP code as a uh, kind of a fuck you to the US government to say, hey, free speech code is speech and we're gonna wear this and, and encryption should be free. So uh, I think he intimately understood what it meant to challenge uh, governments in the status quo. Awesome, all right, and we're here to talk about Bitcoin DeFi. Now, Bitcoin doesn't natively support DeFi. It's, it's a little bit more straightforward than other blockchains. What is meant by Bitcoin DeFi? Like, what does it mean? How does it work? Yeah, so DeFi stands for decentralized finance for folks who don't know what that word means. And on Bitcoin, Bitcoin's a very basic protocol. It doesn't have all the bells and whistles and really cool things that Solana and Ethereum can do. However, it can do some things. And what we saw uh, happen with ordinals are that Bitcoin was able to do some smart contract capabilities in terms of like NFTs, uh, BRC20 tokens, uh, different token standards. Uh, so that was a pretty big uh, kind of evolution. So I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit here, but yeah, Bitcoin is essentially is very simple. And so DeFi didn't start on Bitcoin, it started on Ethereum and Solana, but we have seen some uh, glimmers that we could bring some of this back to Bitcoin, whether it be a little bit on the base layer with like discrete log contracts or with ordinals or on Bitcoin L2s. Uh, L2s allow you to have f you know, full scripting capabilities that uh, you would have on Ethereum and Solana. Cool. Um, what are the most exciting parts of Bitcoin DeFi right now and where do you see the biggest investment opportunities? So people forget that Bitcoin isn't just the biggest crypto asset in the space. It's bigger than everything else combined. It's bigger than Ethereum plus Solana plus everything else. If we were able to unlock DeFi on top of Ethereum, on top of Bitcoin, this would be the greatest opportunity ever to exist in the space. And so we're starting to see glimmers of this happening. And we're talking about a trillion dollar plus asset where people could borrow dollars using their Bitcoin as collateral. They could lend out their Bitcoin. So to see this happen would be incredible. And we're already starting to see this. Um, and we're talking about both Bitcoin and the blossoming of like digital assets on top of Bitcoin, like NFTs or tokens. Um, so you've got like Ethereum's market cap, and then you have the, all the tokens in NFTs on Ethereum. Well, Bitcoin is starting to have that develop there as well. Cool. And what is meant by Bitcoin staking? How does that work? 
Yeah, so there's, uh, you know, with a proof of stake protocol, you stake the asset to represent your provable stake that could be burnt if you behave improperly as a validator. Um, Bitcoin being used for staking is a paradigm that no one predicted. Essentially, with proof of stake protocols, they usually use the underlying native asset. That native asset, though, leads to some issues that occur because that native asset may not have, it may not be a money that people want to own or hold. Uh, whereas Bitcoin is the best money in the, in the crypto ecosystem. And so because of that, Bitcoin being used as collateral uh, for proof of stake systems uh, is a multi-hundred billion dollar opportunity within the Bitcoin DeFi category on Bitcoin. So, uh, you know, for example, like when you stake, you could have Bitcoin being used as stake on a, on a different proof of stake chain where you could provably lock up Bitcoin as collateral on the Bitcoin base layer and then use that to represent state, a stake somewhere else. You know, the value of that across all the proof of stake chains could be in the hundreds of billions. So uh, Babylon is one of the leading uh, proof of stake or restaking tools out there. And you mentioned Babylon. Yeah, recently it raised its caps and it um, saw an influx of, or at least it now has 24,000 Bitcoin uh, being staked through it. Does this show that there's a lot of pent-up demand for Bitcoin DeFi in general? Yeah, there's a couple indicators to look at Bitcoin DeFi. One is we can look at the Ordinals ecosystem. With Ordinals, we have billions of dollars worth of BRC20 tokens that have been created and a billion dollars plus of NFT assets. When we look at Bitcoin L2s, you have Stax, which is a, has a $3 billion market cap. Then you have Babylon with 22,000 Bitcoin being locked up or 24,000. Um, these are all indications, strong indications, that there are tens of billions of dollars that are actively currently being deployed in Bitcoin DeFi, but Bitcoin's market cap is a trillion dollars. So this is just scratching the surface on what we're going to see there. Um, yeah, tens of billions isn't the right number. It's hundreds of billions. Or when Bitcoin, this is a bit of a controversial statement, when Bitcoin's at a three trillion or five trillion mark, market cap, what if all the DeFi on top of Bitcoin is worth a trillion? I mean, Bitcoin's, these numbers are, are quite crazy to think about, especially when you look at Ethereum, where you look at what percentage of Ethereum is locked up, you know, in terms of TVL. And if you look at Ethereum L2s, what's the market cap of all the Ethereum L2s as a percentage of Ethereum's market cap? If we start to play out those numbers with Bitcoin, these numbers get huge. But what are the biggest challenges of bringing DeFi to Bitcoin, a platform that isn't natively designed to support tokens and everything else? Yeah, so the reason why Bitcoin isn't an EVM chain um, or an SVM chain, the reason why it doesn't have all the smart contracting capabilities on the base layer is that we wanted to keep Bitcoin simple. Bitcoin's use case is primarily being a gold 2.0 store of value asset, and it does that very, very well. And so Bitcoin traded off all those cool things you could do with those EVM chains to preserve its decentralization, to be the most strong, rigorous, trustworthy money out there. It pushes a lot of these scripting capabilities to its L2s. So for example, like uh, Stacks or Lightning or Liquid, those are L2s where with some of these, for example, some of these new L2s that are coming out, these are EVM or SVM L2s. So you can basically copy paste your Solana or Ethereum dApp over to this Bitcoin L2, and there are bridged Bitcoin that you take and, and move up to that Bitcoin L2 that allow you to move that, all the bridged Bitcoin on that on the Bitcoin L2 is uh, Bitcoin that can be freely used in smart contracts with the full scripting capabilities of Ethereum or Solana. Um, so that's how the Bitcoin community decided it would scale and also decided how smart contracts would function, is that they would function more on these L2s. There are some really interesting developments though, however, like with ordinals, for example, Ordinals, uh, or you know, for those who don't know what ordinals are, <clears throat> ordinals are NFTs and other tokens on top of Bitcoin. But what's brilliant about this is it's not a Bitcoin L2. It's actually called a meta protocol, which means that on the Bitcoin base layer, this activity is going on. And if we all run the same software, that meta protocol software, we can interpret things that are going on on the L1 and prescribe those alternative, uh, like alternative sort of things that are occurring. So for example, if I send Bitcoin to Tim, if we're both running the same meta protocol software, that's actually an asset transfer of like real estate or another token type. 
So this is an early, ver the, the earlier version of this is called colored coins, and this is a more modern uh, meta protocols or uh, ordinals or a more modern take on this. Um, so meta protocols, I think, are very underexplored, <clears throat> and those would allow for a sort of quasi smart contract capability on the Bitcoin base layer. Um, when we look at other things on top of Bitcoin as well, we have discrete log contracts allow for quite sophisticated smart contracts to be developed on Bitcoin today. So companies like Atomic Finance or Liquidium, those are actual dApps on top of Bitcoin that occur to, that work today that use discrete law contracts to do things like decentralized options. Or you could borrow Bitcoin using your NFT as collateral. So these work on Bitcoin's base layer today. Sure. And for a long time, the big narrative about Bitcoin was that it's a store of value. That was the big, you know, branding of it. Does bringing DeFi to Bitcoin contradict that? Because now you're suddenly saying, whoa, it can do so much more than that. Yeah, so that's a good question. A lot of people sit, would, would ask, is this DeFi play on Bitcoin? Is this, mean a, is this a pivot of the narrative? Is Bitcoin changing? Uh, did Bitcoin store value thesis fail? When we look at a store value asset like Bitcoin, Bitcoin has done a phenomenal job of being a gold 2.0. I mean, we have Larry Fink, the CEO of BlackRock, hard shilling on CNBC that Bitcoin is a store of value asset. This is huge. And Bitcoin's characteristics make it a great store of value asset. Um, when we look at DeFi, DeFi I think just unlocks and is a, is a very complementary narrative to the store of value narrative. We're talking about all this stored value here, but what if we can borrow against it? What if we can lend it out? What if we can yield farm with it? This, I think, is very complementary and also highlights, or what if we can use Bitcoin as another proof of stake asset? Uh, this is all very complementary to the store of value narrative because Bitcoin has conquered the money narrative. It is, is the quintessential number one money in the crypto world. It sort of conquered that narrative. Now DeFi, I'd say, allows it to blossom and really unlocks a lot more. Are there any potential negative impacts, such as it could introduce things like MEV, which we've seen on Ethereum, or big increase in, in, in transaction fees that we have with ordinals? Are there issues that you know, can come out of doing this? Yeah, so MEV on Ethereum, basically this is uh, where folks who are, can, can extract value by front-running transactions when, you, when your transaction hits the mempool. Um, MEV is always going to occur. I think it is, is sort of a problem that can't really be solved and is just sort of a function of how blockchains will always function. Um, so for me, that's not necessarily a concern. Transaction fees, so a lot of people would complain that transaction fees rising, a lot of people here probably use Ethereum and are familiar with how bad transaction fees have gotten, especially during highly congested uh, moments. High fees aren't a bad thing. With all of these blockchains, these high fees are the only way that their long-term security budget or the long-term security paid to stakers or miners, incent are, this is the only way that they are incentivized to keep protecting the network. Uh, so high fees are not a bad thing. The base layer was always going to be where the high-value transactions occurred, and these high-value transactions were willing to pay high fees to exist. So I view the high fees as not a problem, but actually a great um, validation that the security of Bitcoin long-term is indeed intact because uh, over time, Bitcoin transaction fees will have to rise in order to secure the network, uh, to keep the network security at least the same it is today or better. Uh, so th I think ordinals, uh, other DeFi activity, L L2s, these are all very indicative of Bitcoin's long-term fee market existing in a way that's stable. Okay, and um, Bitcoin DeFi had a very strong narrative earlier this year, like we saw, it was sort of the talk of the town you know, around March, April sort of time. It seems to have been a little bit sort of overshadowed by sort of meme coins, which has sort of taken over everything. It seems to be the dominant narrative, the dominant thing this cycle. Um, do you think Bitcoin DeFi is going to sort of come back into focus anytime soon? Yeah, that's a great question. The, uh, the meme coin narrative is super strong. And, and I mean, it's hard to beat it as well. Like, I do appreciate meme coins from its purity perspective. Meme coins aren't promising you a... a a crazy new encryption technique or a, uh, a roadmap with a, a team of 100 people that need to go execute to go promote this new crypto asset and you know this new smart contract platform. Meme coins just are. It's just a meme. That's it. It's somewhat elegant and simplistic with its, its narrative in a way that's highly memetic because of how simplistic it is. 
Um, I think that meme coins are a permanent feature <clears throat> of the space, Dogecoin. I mean, I, I remember when Dogecoin, Dogecoin first came out. Like, Dogecoin is a, has been around for 10 years now. You know, so Could be. It's been a while. It's been a long time. Yeah, Jackson Palmer, you know, when he first invented uh, him and uh, I figured his co-founder first invented it. Um, Dogecoin was one of the first meme coins out there. <clears throat> and we haven't seen Dogecoin going to go away. So I think... <coughs> I think Dogecoin is in Dogecoin and meme coins are going to, going to be a permanent fixture in this space. Um, but like any other narrative in this in crypto, it will ebb and flow. And I think right now is a really hot time. But I don't think that'll be the predominant narrative, you know, for multiple cycles. I think it'll it'll be more of a minority narrative. Yeah. Okay. And what are your predictions going forward about Bitcoin DeFi this cycle? Yeah. So my predictions for Bitcoin DeFi. I think we see a Bitcoin L2 hit a $100 billion market cap. I think we see a handful of Bitcoin L2s hit tens of billions of dollars in market cap. I think we see total value locked on Bitcoin represent 10 or 20% of all BTC, uh, which this would be like total value locked as like Bitcoin being used as a proof of stake asset or Bitcoin being borrowed against, so locked up and people borrowing dollars against it. Um, so I would say 10 to 20% of Bitcoin locked up in TVL uh, hundreds of billions of dollars in value generated for L2s, meta protocols, dApps, and uh, different crypto assets on top of Bitcoin. Okay. And as we've been heavily focusing on, on DeFi, do you have any thoughts about the project that's very closely tied to Donald Trump? It's called World Liberty Financial, and they're claiming to save the world through a fork of Aave. Yeah, I mean, if Donald Trump is shilling you a coin, I wouldn't buy that. It's, just, it's not something you want to purchase. Uh, it's, it's, it's very simplistically a quick cash grab by the Trump family. Um, I find it pretty appalling and embarrassing for Americans that he's trying, during a presidential campaign, he's pushing uh, this, this project that he's, he's encouraging people to invest in. Okay, uh, and as we sort of wrap up, I guess... Um I wanted to ask about like the name of the company you work for, Asymmetric. What's meant by asymmetric within crypto? Why do we use that term? So Asymmetric was founded by Joe McCann. Uh, Joe McCann is an early Solana investor and early meme coin investor. So Asymmetric has three funds, uh, one venture fund, one liquid fund that Joe runs, and then I run the Bitcoin DeFi venture fund with Joe. Uh, the Bitcoin DeFi venture fund focuses in the Bit Bitcoin DeFi category. Uh, this was the, a very contrarian trade. And at Asymmetric, we're willing to be contrarians, whereas like most venture capitalists in this space crowd chase whatever hot narrative there is. Um, that's where we've seen so many VCs pivot from crypto to AI in this cycle, right? Over the last couple of years, all of a sudden their bios are changing out for, uh, you know, instead of crypto, it's saying AI plus crypto. With us, we like to be contrarian, and Bitcoin DeFi was a very hated trade. A hated trade, a contrarian trade, are the ones that we like. Um, Bitcoin DeFi was hated by both Bitcoin maximalists and everyone in crypto because they're like, that's not possible on top of Bitcoin. Those are the sort of narratives, those are the sort of trades that we like to explore. Um, same with Solana. Solana, in the, in, the, in the pits of the bear market this cycle, Solana traded, what did it trade, $8? It reached, a, yeah, it reached single digits. Joe was still a huge fan of Solana, and Solana is now trading at $140. So we are willing to make those contrarian bets. We like to take the aggressive stance that's aggressively anti-trend. Um, so for us, the meme coin cycle right now is a huge validation of uh, Joe being early on that thesis and Bitcoin DeFi, uh, my thesis on that space. So asymmetric represents you know, these asymmetric opportunities that exist in these sort of tail investments that no one else finds attractive in the moment. That's where we like to explore. That's where we like to go identify opportunity. Awesome. Thank you so much. And I'm afraid that's all we've got time for. Um, I've been Tim Copeland, Editor-in-Chief of The Block. Thanks, Dan. Maybe a round of applause for Dan. Thanks, guys.